ahead and jump right in then. So what's happening in the market? Why are interest rates spiking this last couple of weeks? What happened? Were we all wrong? No, maybe. Well, let's dig into that. So it's been a little rough this last couple of weeks. And um, here's my little... There we go. Maybe we were wrong. There you go. Little South Park. What are rates going to do? I mean, this last, we were, we're expecting March madness, right? Everyone was saying March, we're going to have the feds cutting rates. And that was going to be, gonna be the, the catalyst that brought us down to this dropping of interest rates. Well, guess what? This last two weeks, rates have spiked. So we're going to look at why. We're going to look at what's going to be happening in the future and uh, how we can prepare our buyers uh, and what we can do in, the, in as an industry. So first off, Mr. Uh, Mr. Powell here, inflation is still too high. And uh, yes, yeah, so we had some scare a couple last last couple of weeks on inflation. Um, here's some of the posts that I saw this week on inflation across the globe. So we saw Europe stubborn. Stubborn inflation means the Fed will be cutting rates less than the market thought. All of these inflation showing it's stubborn. Stock sink as stubborn inflation resets Fed for rate forecasts. Uh, stubborn inflation, economic resilience, major themes in U.S. outlook. Stubborn inflation keeps upward pressure on rates. Stubborn, stubborn. It's all saying stubborn, stubborn. Can't shake off stubborn inflation. Economists see stubborn U.S. core inflation keeping rates higher. So why is it stubborn? First off, inflation is the absolute enemy of interest rates. Um, if we have inflation, that means interest rates have to stay high. It's just a given. Inflation is a bad thing for mortgage rates. So when we saw the surprises happen with PPI, per, the pro producer price index rose 0 0.30 in January. It was supposed to be at 0.1. That was a big surprise. Inflation is hotter. Core inflation, which strips out food and energy, that rose 0.5, which is much hot, hotter than the expectations of the 0.1. So we saw inflation numbers surprised everybody. Everyone thought they were going to be coming a little bit, coming down last couple of weeks. And when this came out, it was kind of like a, a, a you know, Mike Tyson shot to the face. So when, when we look at core inflation at 0.5 for the month over month, basically what that means is if you multiply that by 12, that's the annual inflation rate. That would mean it would be core at 6% if we had every month at 0.5, which is way higher than the 2% that the Fed wants year over year, way over. So that surprised the markets. Um, and then the, the last week's, the initial jobless claims came in and they were much lower than expected. The jobless claims actually dropped 12,000. Continuing claims of people that have been on unemployment, that dropped. And it was still higher than normal, but that dropped. Just overall, it was a bad couple of weeks. And then Things to watch out for coming up because employment numbers show the cracks in the economy. Higher unemployment, that shows the cracking of the economy, right? The, that's what the feds want to see. So things to watch out this March 8th, March 8th, coming up in a week and a half, is going to be the next jobs report. That is going to be critical. Um, here's a little bit of the... Um, oh, I'm going to go back a little bit. So... We see all of this good news in the markets, good news in the economy. When I say good news, it's still a hot economy. That's what these numbers say. But is it? Or is this a, a false hope? Um, or not a false, but a false reading, so, so to speak, on what the markets truly are doing. Is inflation rising now? Or is, just a, is this just a blip on the radar? Well, we're going to see this week some very, very, very important numbers coming out, and I'm going to go over that next. So here we go. Is inflation cooling? That's what this number will tell us this week, because we have inflation numbers coming out this week. Is this going to be what we expect for the for inflation moving forward? This is what we want. We want inflation cooling. We want that fan on us. We want to go, whoo, right? Um, <clears throat> but will that happen? Here's the market predictions for this coming week. So last couple of weeks, inflation was hotter than expected. Employment was hotter than expected. What's gonna be expected for this week? So this is the, the week's project, per, um, projections, predictions. 
GDP is coming out on Wednesday. Um, that number is going to be a mixed bag. If that's hotter than expected, um, it's going to be interesting to say what happens. But the PCE, this is the inflation number that the feds like the most. It's at 2.6. It's going to go to 2.5 based on all of the predictions with everyone that's looking at it. Now, keep in mind, two weeks ago, everyone was predicting that the inflation numbers would come in lower and they came in hotter. But these are the predictions that the market says will happen this week. And then we have the core, which uh, strips out food and energy. That's going to go from 2.9 to 2.8. So that means inflation is cooling. Now, this is the inflation numbers that the feds really like. So it's going to be interesting to see how these numbers come out. So it's going to be a big, big week. Here's a lot that's happening. There's a lot that's happening this week. So we have a couple of treasury auctions happening today. The treasury auctions, <clears throat> excuse me. The treasury auctions that happened the last couple of weeks, they were all very bad. They didn't get their like C and D ratings, according to the people that were grade how well auctions go. So they didn't go very well. Um, so hopefully these will go well. Uh, durable goods orders, that's how, many, how much uh, companies are ordering things to sell. Um, how good those orders are is coming out tomorrow. We've got the case chiller coming out. That's going to be interesting to watch for home prices. Um, but consumer confidence is going to be a big one. That's going to be coming out tomorrow. That's going to really show what the what the buying patterns are uh, for consumers at the at the latest time in history, right right now. Uh, Wednesday we have New Zealand talking about their interest rate decisions, and again we've seen some of those headlines. It's being stubborn globally. Um, some markets are better than others, and then GDP, um, of course, on Wednesday. But Thursday is going to be very exciting. So we've got initial jobless claims. So hopefully we're going to see cracks in that. We're going to see jobless claims increasing. Uh, PCE, remember we want to see those predictions from this one right here at 2.4 and 2.8. That's where these numbers are going to be coming out, the PCE and then this core PCE. Hopefully, guys, we will see this come down. We need to break free. Um, we need, And I'll show you a little bit on the charts what's happening with the mortgage rates. And kind of we're we're in like a squeeze box, but I'll show you that in a second. Uh, but we have jobless claims, uh, continuing jobless claims coming out on Thursday. So Thursday is a really, really big day. Um, really um, not worried. I'm hopeful that the PCE and the and the, the uh, core PCE will come in uh, for some good news for us. So keep our fingers crossed. Last week, we thought we were going to get it good. And we got a Mike Tyson blow to the chin. So let's look at the bond market trends to kind of see what mortgage rates are doing and uh, where we're at. So this is a really interesting chart. Um, I like this chart because it shows what the Fannie Mae 30 year is doing on the trend line. So I draw the trend line right here. We had a spike here or a peak here, a peak here, a peak here, and a peak here. Well, today we opened up outside of that range. So the bond market is actually up a little today, which is a good sign. If we would have kept underneath this in this little squeeze back, squeeze box, and then we were pushed below this, there's a lot of room to fall. So the fact that we opened above this is a really, really good sign. But we've got this Fibonacci here, this level here where we, we haven't been able to pierce through here or here or here. So we're trying to break free here. We're trying to get above this. Hopefully we will to break this pattern. Uh, so that's the Fannie Mae 30 year. Now the 10 year is also stuck. It's trying to rise above this level right here. Well, we, wa we want the 10 year to be below. We want the 10 year to go down. Mortgage rates will go down when the 10 year goes down. We want this to hold here, hold this line. And we want the 10 year to bounce below this. So the fact that the 10 year has tried to go above here and it dropped, tried to go above here, and it dropped, tried to go above here. It went above it, but came back down. And then it's stuck here, and it's stuck here. It's come down. This is really, really good news for us to give us, hopefully, momentum to break free and have a little bit better interest rates. And yes, it's time to break free. We need this inflation numbers to come in good. We need to break free because we're in this pattern right here where we should. The markets want to come down. But will they is the question. So um, let's look at the Fannie Mae Freddie Mac predictions now. 
So right now, the Fannie Mae predictions for the 30-year fixed rate, the average, they said the average for the quarter in Q1 was going to be 6.5. Well, we were we hit that rate, but then we spiked back up. So um, actually, it was 6.4. We they're they're predicting that it's going to end at 6.5. They're going to be wrong. So the, we're going to end the quarter, I think, a little. Um, well, I hope, let's just say, that we end a little bit lower because this would mean that rates will drop a half um, in the next month in March, right? Um, and then Q2, it's supposed to go to 6.3. It was predicted 6.2. Q4, 6.1. So all of these numbers, guys, are a little bit worse than their or earlier predictions. But if inflation continues to be stubborn, the, they may have to redo these uh, estimates. And then 5.9 at the end of the year. And then look what their predictions are still for 2025. High fives at the beginning of the year, Q2 dropping, and then Q3 and Q4 staying the same. So high fives. Um, previous predictions were showing the end of 2025, potentially in the fours. So I think the, this, the stubborn inflation is going to be here for a while. I don't think we're going to see rates come down as much as we thought. They're still going to come down, but it's going to be stubborn. Part of the biggest reasons why inflation is going to be stubborn is wage inflation. People are demanding higher wages. When you have higher wages, the cost of everything goes up because if you're a store that's a mom and pop store and all of the goods you're purchasing are now more expensive, to keep your doors open, you have to raise the prices. And that's where inflation starts. So wage inflation, we're gonna really watch that carefully. That's the biggest, most damaging inflation because it's the tide that rises all ships. If wages are higher, everything's going to be higher. And uh, in California, they're trying to pass a minimum wage of $50 an hour. Imagine what that's going to do to the prices of fast food. It's, I mean, you're going to see fast food closing shops left and right there. It's just not possible unless you automate literally everything. So it's going to be interesting to watch. Wage inflation is going to be really the, um, the thing to watch for. Okay, so let's look at rates live right now. I want to show you guys where we are right now. Um, I'm going to sh I'm going to sh open this up real fast. Bear with me one moment while I share this. And yes, I'm still sharing my screen. So this is this is where rates are right this second. With a this is a really good average, guys. This is just on Google. You click in mortgage rates, you can kind of see what rates are doing. Everyone wants to know what's your rate. Well, you can go here and get an average of what to expect. It's a um, a little bit shocking because if you think you've got really good credit, let's just say you think you've got an 800 credit and you're a 600,000 with 35% down on a conventional loan, you're right at the 7% level. But if you think you have good credit, but it's really a 720, you're seven and a quarter now. If you think you have good credit, but something pops up on your credit and now you're at like a 680, you're at 7.4. But what if you don't have 35% down? What if you only have 20% down? Look how much it can increase by your credit score. Less down, lower than normal credit score. But if we go back to 800 credit score, you're still in the, on the low sevens with 20% down. So this is a really good tool to kind of see where on average rates are based on credit score. If you're trying to do a conventional loan with a really low credit score, you're going to be really high. That's where we switch to FHA. And if you ever get offers for FHA, you wonder why they're going FHA. FHA has a lot better rates when you have lower credit score. Um, look at the difference here. I'm going to put, put, put conventional 30-year fix back up there. The difference between a FHA and a conventional with the same credit scores, it's 1% better in rate. That's why a lot of people go FHA if they have lower credit scores. Um, so this is a really good tool, but this gives you a live representation of kind of where rates are at. If you're really, really good, you have an 800 credit score and you're doing a 30-year fixed um, with 20% down or more, 35% down, you're going to get a nice low rate. But if your lower credit scores, it's going to be a little bit more um, frustrating for you. All right, so let me go back to my- Would that um, FHA um, 
interest rate, though, have mortgage insurance premium, or is that a 20% down? FHA, regardless of the down payment, will always have mortgage insurance. So good question. Um, but still, if you have a low credit score with 5% down, FHA is 7.683, and conventional is 8.5. So sometimes it actually makes more sense to get the lower rate with mortgage insurance, the payment's better than a conventional. And that's where we look at that side-by-side -side comparison to see what makes most, most sense for the consumer. If we did an FHA loan with mortgage insurance with a 620 credit score, your payment may be less. And then we help boost their credit back up and then in six months, refinance them into an, a conventional loan. So that's some of the things that we'll look at. Um, let me jump into jump back into the presentation real fast. So that's kind of where mortgage rates are. Um, oh gosh, let me go. I just went right from the beginning. Sorry about that. Uh, let's look to see what the next steps are uh, for my real estate hacks. So one of the things that um, I want all of you to really know how to do is to properly manage an FHA buyer when you're shopping for homes, when you're looking at condos. So this advice or hack or whatever you want to call it is for FHA buyers only looking for condos. So if you have anyone, because they're being squeezed out of the price range, they're in the condos for, um, market now and you have an FHA buyer, how do you efficiently shop for mortgages? Because they have to be FHA approved condos. So I put this together for you to kind of show you what we can do. So the first step, is we need to know the zip codes your buyers are in. And the reason you need to know the zip codes your buyers are looking in, we need to eliminate every condo that is not FHA approved. So find the zip codes that your buyer is going to be shopping in, and then go to the FHA website to find all of the condos that are approved that are in that zip code. I'm gonna show you what that looks like in just a second. But we go to this link, you click on this link, and this is the website that this is what it looks like. You go in here, you choose Arizona, California, wherever you're at. You put the county, you know, let's just say Maricopa. And then you put the zip code in here. Let's just do 85254 and hit status, only approved, and hit send. Here's your list of FHA approved condos in that zip code. Notice there's only three. So now you're eliminating all of those condos that maybe your customer was wanting to see. You're narrowing it down just to three that will have an approvable condominium for them. So you locate those listings only in these communities. You put the MLS search just for those three communities and the listings within them. And now you're only gonna be driving them around to, to FHA approved condos that you know you can get a loan for. So a lot of times I see customers uh, or real estate agents send me condos. Is this FHA approved? Is this FHA approved? My customer really wants this. We're gonna go see these five properties tomorrow. Which ones are FHA approved? You can do this just by clicking on this little link right here. And I'm happy to look it up for you as well, but you can click this link up here first then create the list of condos that are approved, then send them to them. That way they're not looking at all these other options that may be better and they're getting disappointed because the only three that are FHA approved, they didn't really like. So Does this, this apply to VA or a conventional? Is there any other restrictions? Good question. This right now is just for an FHA buyer, but VA is the same way. Conventional, there isn't a list like this for conventional loans. Fannie Mae has an internal list that we can reach into, go into them to find out um, if it is an acceptable project with them. But this is just for FHA right now. But VA is the same exact way as this. It's just a different website to look up. How Good about townhomes? Are they falling? Good question. Okay, so I'm going to get into the townhomes for just a second. Townhomes may or may not be a true condo. A true townhouse or townhome owns the dirt 
underneath it. That would still be considered a an attached single family residence. So it's still, it's not a condo. If you look up the legal description of a property and it says Scottsdale townhomes, and that's the marketing name for it, do not take that as gospel, as that property is a true townhome. It may be a condo. And the reason is builders went in and went into the county and said, okay, I want to subdivide these uh, into townhomes, all of these lots into townhomes so I can build townhouses. And then the county said, okay, that'll be $52,000. And they said, well, wow, okay, let's just let's just call it a condo. And that way I don't have to, to um, do any type of lot splits or anything. It's cheaper for me. And we'll just build townhomes, but just keep the zoning condominium. You'll see that across the valley. You'll see it everywhere. You'll see townhomes that literally have their own backyard, single level, two level, but there's one unit attached to other one. And they look like town, townhouses, but they're zoned condos. You would still need to make sure that they're, con, they're FHA approved there. So if you have a townhouse, look at the legal description to see what it truly is. If it says horizontal property regime or condominium in the legal description, it is not a townhouse. It is a condo, and if it is a condo, it has to be FHA approved if you have an FHA buyer. So that was a whole nother rabbit trail, but very, very good question. So is the buyer dying to live in a condo that's not FHA approved? Here's the magic. We can actually, if they want a specific condo, they're dying to have it, but it, you know it's not on the approved list, we can do a spot approval. We can do a it's now they're called a single unit approval. Now it's not a guarantee. We can go into that project that's not FHA approved, look at that unit and see if we can reach out to FHA with all of the documentation needed to try to get that specific unit approved for the FHA loan. So does it take a while to do? Yes, this will not be a three week, four week close, but it is possible to get a single unit approval on a non-approved condo. So that's a little bit of a hack. If you have a listing that is not an FHA approved condo, you may want to explore getting that specific unit approved so it opens up your buyer pool. Sean, it's a little bit of work to do that, but it is something that you can do. So if your buyer can't find anything that's good, try to find something that are that is approved that they like and they see something that is not approved, but they really are in love with it, let's give it a go. Let's see if it can get a spot approval. John, so, no. what if I have a listing that's not approved? Can I go through that same hoopla prior you can. to putting it we on can, the market? We can work with you on that to gather all the documentation needed, but you need an FHA case number to start that process with FHA, which means we need to have a active loan file to do it. So okay. it, it's kind of frustrating that you have to do that, but we can upfront gather everything and get it ready. So when you have a buyer, we have everything ready to go. Hey, Sean. Okay. Yes. Does it, does it help if the um, seller already has an FHA loan on the property? Sometimes, but sometimes the FHA, um, hold on one second. Um, sometimes the FHA approval, and I'll show you this real fast, can be expired. So they may have had it approved before. And let me show you what that looks like. Um, expired, send. So this property right here, Discovery at Tatum, this was FHA approved. So if you bought, if somebody bought a home with an FHA loan in May of 2020, it was approved at that time. And now it's expired. So if you look to see, oh, this person has an FHA loan, should be good to go. Not always the case. So you have to look. So when you do that search, if you do under status here, all, it'll tell you all of the units that are in here and they're what they are. If it was, this one tried to get approved and it was rejected. Look at single unit approval, rejected. See that? This somebody tried to get this project approved for a single unit approval and it was rejected. So 
A lot of times there's a reason why these condos are not approved. Um, either their budget isn't set up properly, they don't have the proper insurance, um, there's too many investors in the complex, uh, so the saturation is too high. Usually there's a reason. If there's no reason, it's just that they it fell off and now nobody's taken the, the time to get it reapproved. That's when we could, the single unit approval may work. Um, but this re running these reports is invaluable to saving you time up front when you're looking at properties for your buyers. Um, but yeah, this is a really, really important thing to do. So this report, again, VA is the same way, different website, but the same way. You can still do the same thing with VA. Um, but yeah, that's how you do that search through this fancy little link here. Um, and it's just, you did, if you Google FHA approved condos, FHA approved condos, if you just do that, Google that, this is the first link you get. This is the link you want to click on to get this search tool. So very, very good question. Um, all right, I'm gonna stop sharing this one real fast and jump back in. Any questions that you guys have on FHA approved condos and how to set this up for success if you have buyers searching for condos that are FHA approved? Any questions? Fantastic. If you do have questions, I'm gonna stay on afterwards where you can jump into that. So that just, was my hack of the week. What about some tools? Okay, so what are some tools that you can use to help your buyers get off the fence? So we have these real estate report cards that we can create for you for the zip code, for the city, for the area that your customers are looking for homes to show them what the projections are and the overall health of that little area. It's a nice little report card. It only takes me a few seconds to create. I go in here, I put the zip code in and I'll tell you what the forecasted appreciation is. Um, it'll tell you what the historic appreciation has been. Notice the last five years, it's been very high because we had a couple really big years. Overall, it's right around the 4.43. And it kind of shows you, it kind of shows you here uh, what the percentage of active listings are that are new. It's gone up. So we're seeing positive movement in that area as far as inventory goes. And um, how many homes were built uh, per year? And then it goes into the demographics, uh, homeowners versus renters, affordability index, kind of a neat little tool that you can send your buyers for specific areas if they're really wondering, is now a good time? What's the future going to look like? Um, nice little tool for you. John? Yes. Um, I've started doing open houses again. Could I yeah. get those for like to take to my open houses? Absolutely. And, and also send them to the leads that I got from my last two open houses? Absolutely. If you need any of these for open houses, for customers, you send me the listing and I'll prepare a couple different tools for you, very similar to this, that you can use for those listings. Cool. Absolutely. Thanks. All right. My next one, my, my weekly tip. So I had an idea and almost all of my buyers right now, this is going to be sent. I'm going to be sending this out to all of my pre-approved buyers that I've had for the last two years that still haven't purchased. But if you have a list of buyers that are on the fence, I want you to do this. I want you to create through SurveyMonkey, whatever it is, a little survey and says, I know you're looking to buy. At what rate will we will you want to be at in order for you to be comfortable buying? And I want you to send this out to your buyers. And I want you to get these back. Because if they say, if they say, I want a rate of 6%, call them and say, I have a couple listings that I think we may be able to get for you that have been on the market for a while where the sellers can help buy your rate down to six or 5.5. If I was to get you a rate of 5.5 right now, would you buy a home like this or in this price range? Or would you entertain buying right now? Because we all know what's going to happen when rates hit this level, right? All of these people are going to come in at once and it's going to be like a shark frenzy Everyone's fighting over the same property. It's going to be crazy again. So we want to try to get them to think, okay, they're going to tell us, I'm not going to do anything until they're at four and a half. At that point, you need to say, okay, you're, you're dreaming, you're delusional. But <laughs> if I can get a sellers to buy you, if they hit five and a half, and then I can get down to 4.5 with a seller buy down, would you be doing it then? You can open up that conversation to say, okay, 
I don't think that's going to happen because the, the feds aren't buying mortgage-backed securities at the tune of $80 billion a month to drive down interest rates anymore. They're just not doing it. They're never going to do it again. Their balance sheet is way too high. In fact, so they're selling off those right now. So we're not going to hit four and a half until unless something crazy bad happens um, quickly, right? Will they hit four and a half in the future if the recession hits hit, goes pretty strong? Maybe, but it's going to be very, very un unrealistic to think that they're going to get to three and a half. So if they hit three and a half, different conversation, but you can at least start that conversation to say, okay, if you're not going to buy till three and a half, what if I was to get you a three, two, one buy down and your first rate was two and a half, would you buy then? So it just starts the conversation, helps them get them off the fence to really be open to options. So just a little tip that I think may work. I'm going to do it to see what kind of traction I can get to help get buyers. Cause maybe they don't know they can do that. Um, so how much does seller have to contribute per rate percentage that depends heavily on the customer, but, um, in today's market for every three eighths in rate, it's about one discount point, three eighths to a half. So if you're trying to get down one full percent, it may be two to three discount points to get there on a, Three hundred or four hundred thousand dollar home. That's maybe eight thousand off the selling price. So it's not within, you know, it's it's definitely within the scope of asking them. So good question. But I have a a nice little presentation I can do for your customers if they're looking to do if they want a payment at you know five percent. What we can do to get them there with a a really nice little presentation for them. So. Nice little tip for you. Hopefully it'll work. Um, and this is my QR code that you can take a picture of. You may not be able to take a picture of it on your phone uh, because it's a little bit blurry. But if you scan this with your telephone, you'll be able to download all my information right to your phone and websites, everything. So there's my little QR code. But um, Sean, is that buyer presentation you can do is that like something you send to them or is it something live you do with them both good question so what i do is i'll put together okay here's a list price here's where i think where your agent and i think we can get the negotiation on the rate down to and here's what your payments would look like and i send it to them it's a link they click on that link and then i walk them through every option side by side on a three, two, one buy down, a two, one buy down, a permanent buy down to show them what it could be. If in fact, we can get the seller to give you X dollars to get a lower rate. And will that be comfortable, comfortable enough payment for you to move forward with the property now instead of waiting? Mm -hmm. So yes, there's definitely some really, really good reports I can do to help, um, your buyers really understand what it's going to take and that it is truly realistic to try to get a lower rate now by doing a seller buy down or asking the seller just to give a little bit. And um, it really helps show how much rate does impact their payment and that you can actually get that now. So there's my Monday update. There was a lot I threw at you today. This is all going to be recorded. It's all going to be sent to you so you can review it. So if you have any questions now, I'm going to open it up the chat for you guys to jump in and uh, ask any questions that you may have. So Amy Power said, how much does seller have to contribute per rate percentage? It's about 1% about for every three eighths or half in rate is about what the going cost is right now. And it's 1% uh, of the loan amount that the seller needs to contribute, not the purchase price. So that's a little bit of a, um, a mathematical thing I'll need to run for you to get it exact. So if you want to buy the rate down, I'll crunch those numbers for you to let you know exactly the dollar amount. You're very welcome, Gina. All right. Well, you guys have a wonderful week and uh, Thursday is the big day. So let's all, we're either going to be celebrating or crying. Um, so let's hopefully we'll be celebrating and uh, we'll all be on Monday. Um, very thankful on next Monday morning update, we'll be thankful that the inflation numbers came in lower than expected. And let's hope and pray that that happens. So you guys enjoy your week. If you need anything further, again, I'll be sending this out to you guys so you guys can review it later. If you need anything, I'll be available all week. 
Have a wonderful week and we will talk to you guys soon.